my name is David Mooring. I'm the CEO of IonQ. Um, previously, I was with the federal government. As, as was stated earlier, I um, did a lot of work. I had a portfolio of, of a little over $100 million that funded academic groups and, and businesses all around the world. Um, but for the last nine months, I've been part of um, IonQ, which is a relatively new startup company. Um, that said, we're, we're building the hardware, the software, the middleware, the, the firmware, all the way up, the full stack, all the way up to the, to the cloud interface. Um, this is something that we expect to have fully assembled and ready for tire kicking, if you will, by about this time next year. Um, so as mentioned earlier, one of the things that I'm most happy about working with, um, working in the industry, is that we're able to bring in all of the different capabilities um, in you know, the, the electrical engineers as opposed to just physicists. And this is something that's relatively new in the trapped ion world. Um, as you know, there's a number of companies here that represent superconducting qubits, um, but this is really one of the few companies that's working in trapped ions, um, which is, many of you know, has been one of the leading qubit technologies over the last 20 years since my co-founder, Chris Monroe, of the, now of the University of Maryland, in the mid-1990s first demonstrated the, the, the very first two qubit gates in the trapped ion systems when he was in Dave Weinland's group at NIST. Um, you know, thanks go to our venture capital partners at New Enterprise Associates and at Google Ventures for allowing us to, to be able to build this team. Um, and we're based in College Park, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. So whenever you guys are in Washington, D.C., um, you know, look us up. The, even though we're a relatively young company, we are able to leverage the investments that have been made at both the University of Maryland under the leadership of Chris Monroe, who's a professor of physics there, and at Duke University under the leadership of Jun Sen Kim, who's a professor of electrical and computer engineering. Um, and why the, I mean, so we were talking about IP licensing earlier. This is something that we're able to leverage all of the different, all of the IP that comes out of these out of these research groups, which is important for us because if you look at in this decade alone, they have about $100 million in investment that's going through their research groups. So this is obviously very important for us to be able to leverage this at, at the company. And within our team as a whole, we're currently working with five qubit systems, um, seven qubit systems up that are fully connected. And even more recently, we've started running experiments on 20 and even 50 qubits. Um, whether we talk about, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to open the, the door to quantum supremacy or that sort of discussion today, um, but we, we have been working with, with much larger qubit systems. Um, but I'll focus here on some of the work that we've done on five, five or so qubit systems. But before I do so, I just want to highlight the trapped ion. As, as mentioned, this is you know, a well understood technology to, to a handful of the folks in the room, um, and, but to others it's somewhat exotic. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details of what specific atom we, we trap in our system or how we store the quantum information within that atom. But the important point here is that a single atom or a single charged atom ion is just a fundamentally quantum object. Um, all atoms of a given species are identical, and this is obviously something that's very important if you want to scale up to, to much larger qubit numbers. <clears throat> and, you know, historically for the last 20 years, they have consistently demonstrated some of the longest coherence times. Um, in the specific ion that we use, it was recently demonstrated a T2 coherence time of 10 minutes. Um, and we have very high fidelity gate operations. Um, I, won't, I won't give the numbers. And while I said it, it seems exotic, it's actually relatively straightforward. It's a very old technology. Um, so it, it's actually so old. I mean, the, the first quantum interactions on a single trapped ion were demonstrated even before I was born by what is my academic great-grandfather who won the Nobel Prize in the 80s for this. Um, and then my academic grandfather won the Nobel Prize in the 2010s for this as well. Um, I mention that because it's sometimes said that to build a quantum computer will take three Nobel Prizes. Um, we got two. Um, so, but the, the, the fundamentals of how you trap an individual ion are pretty straightforward. You just trap it with electrical fields um, RF and DC electrical fields, and it can be done either with a, a macro-assembled trap, um, as was done in the 70s and 80s and even 90s, 
um, or what's posterized by science here is a microfabricated silicon trap. And using this sort of technology is obviously important if we want to start manufacturing and having pre, uh, reproducible results. Um, and as was mentioned during the previous talk, this is, because this is a fundamentally quantum entity, a single trapped ion, this is something that shows its quantum behavior even at room temperature. And interestingly, even if you cool it down to four Kelvin or liquid nitrogen, it's the, the quantum bit of information doesn't change. Um, you might do so for electrical engineering reasons, but it has nothing to do with trying to get the quantum nature out of the individual ion. <clears throat> so where are we today? Um, we have built, so this is, these are results that I show from, from late 2016. And what this shows here is a five qubit system that's reprogrammable in the sense that on one and the same hardware device, we're able to run a number of different algorithms um, only by changing the way we do the programming and the software side. So in some sense, like the, the trapped ion approach is like the FPGA of quantum computers. We can build one specific hardware system and the control is actually done on the software side. Um, and one thing I'll point out, even though we focus primarily on the gate-based approach, um, trapped ion systems are equally useful for adiabatic approach or even a hybrid of both gate-based and adiabatic approach. And another, another result that was published earlier this year, and this was a result that was done with our, collaboration, uh, our collaborators at the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and at Microsoft Research. Um, where is Martin? I saw him earlier. Um, so Martin was part of this, um, Martin who spoke earlier was part of this uh, collaboration and what, what they showed in this paper is that the connectivity of your total system really matters. So obviously the, the inherent you know, control you have of your quantum system is something that's important, but even on these small scales of just five ions, what you can see is as you run more and more complex quantum algorithms, already at five qubits, the connectivity matters within the system. And in some sense, this is not surprising at all. Um, you, you, can, you can write down everything you want to know about a five qubit system, but an important point to make here is that as these systems grow to larger and larger qubit sizes and as the algorithms get more and more complex, the connectivity of the, of the overall system is, is exceedingly important. And really, if you, just, just the mathematics of it, if you add one more qubit to an n qubit system in a, in a fully connected trapped ion system, you've added n more connections. Whereas if you look at like a 2D lattice, um, you add only one or two more connections depending on where it fits within that lattice on the, on the ex external of that lattice. Um, so this is something that's very important, not so much at the five qubit scale, but as you grow larger and larger in size. And as mentioned, we, we're able to leverage, even at our young age of a company, um, we, we actually just started, we moved into our permanent space only in April. Um, so somebody said they were going to ask where we stand right now as a company. As a company, we're still relatively young. Um, we have nine, nine full-time employees today. We have a, a few more starting uh, very soon um, that have already accepted offers. But the, the important point here is that within our system over the next year, we're going to build a fully connected, you know, tens of qubit system. And the, the importance of this, uh, the full connectivity is that it allows us really to address the superset of any sort of algorithm that you might think is interesting in a quantum computing system. So because it's fully connected, we don't have to worry, we have the, we have the luxury of not worrying about designing our hardware to a specific algorithm or hard application in the system today. Um, the other thing I like about this, about this graph goes to what I said earlier. Um, about spinning out of an academic lab. And one of the important points here is that if you go into an academic optics lab, uh, atomic physics, uh, ion trap lab, you know, there's a, there's a mess of lasers and optics spread out over an entire table. And the reason that's the case is because in an academic setting, you try to build a system that is flexible to do absolutely anything you want. Whereas at a company, we're building a system that can really, as well as possible, address the potential needs of the, of the end users, the customers, and, and very, very focused on what we want to do for the algorithm execution. Um, so one of, my, one of my friends said it well, is that when you know exactly what you want to make, you can make it small. And we're also able to, in this technology, while some of this is relatively brute force today, and some of this is already starting to incorporate technologies from other fields, 
What's important about the trapped ion technology is that not only are we using the silicon fabrication technology that I showed you earlier for the ion trap itself, but we're also able to harvest a lot of the technology development that's from the optical communications um, industry into our system. So the next slide, the transition to the next slide was supposed to be smooth, but the previous speaker didn't show up. Um, so what you did not hear Ronald Hansen say is that when you try to scale beyond a single elementary logic unit, as is labeled on the slide, as you scale beyond you know, the 50, the 100 qubits that you can put into one chain, the 1,000 qubits that you might be able to put in one vacuum chamber or, or dilution refrigerator or whatever your, whatever your favorite qubit technology is, at some point this has to scale modular. And this is very similar to the way that classical computing has gone modular. It didn't go modular immediately, but at some point you know if you want very powerful computers, you need to go modular. And what's tricky about making a modular quantum computer is that the modular piece, the way you communicate from one module to another has to be completely coherent and it has to be completely coupled to the, to the qubit memory that you have at each module. Um, and this is something that Ronald Hansen and the folks at, at, at Delft have done recently with their um, NV centers. Um, very beautiful experiments they've done there. Um, and this, you can't read what year is on that, but it's from 2004, so this is from my PhD um, over 10, 15 years ago, where we first demonstrated this networking of, of ions and ion qubit memories and photonic networks. And Philippe Grangier also knows a, a little something about this, um, you know, having demonstrated this sort of technology well over, well over 10 years ago. And this is the combination of being able to scale down in size and scaling up in the qubit number is something that give, makes us very bullish on the trapped ion quantum computing approach. So I prepared for 15 minutes. I was given 20. I'll stop now. <laughs>